I'm thankful. Are you thankful? Don't we have a lot to be thankful for? We do. We do. We are wrapping up a series tonight that we've been on for the last couple of weeks. I, I really hate to wrap it up because I love this book so much. We've been in the book of Psalms, and I could probably spend months on that book. There's so many great things that God speaks to us out of that book uh, of Psalms. Um, but due to calendar and things like that, I, um, uh, I, I had something from one of the Psalms that I wanted to share with you tonight. We've been talking about, over the last couple of weeks, keepsake and how God desires us to have his word planted deeply in our heart, written on the walls of our heart, so that in times of turmoil, in times of despair, in times where you're needing to figure out how you can trust the Lord, in times where you're needing direction, in times when you're needing comfort, in times when you find yourself in a trial or a battle or walking through sludge and, 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 and spiritually speaking or in, in, a, in a, uh, a, a season of dryness, that when we have the word of God buried deep in our heart, the Holy Spirit can then quicken that word as a reminder. And God uses his word to speak. God uses his word to, to give us direction and instruction and advice, advice and comfort and things that we need when we need them. And the problem is, is that when we haphazardly read his word, when we when we don't understand what his word says or, 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 or um, read it enough to even know what it says, when we don't take the time to memorize and to dig in and to eat, spiritually speaking, then the Holy Spirit can't quicken us to his word because we don't know his word. Does that make sense? It's important for us as not just believers, but more so as disciples, as his followers, to know God's word. So we've been talking about some spiritual disciplines that come from Psalms, that we are to keep his word as a keepsake. We talked about remembering and having the word in us so that God can bring back the, 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 his word to our minds and we can speak it, we can live it. We talked about memorizing it so that we can remember. And tonight, I want to talk about something that's a little different in the sense of what we've been talking about, but I think it's a spiritual discipline that as believers and as, as disciples that we ought to practice every single day. Turn to your neighbor and say, forgiveness. Forgiveness ought to be a spiritual discipline on a daily basis. Anybody want to raise your hand and claim to be perfect? Go ahead. Just, just raise it. You make all the right decisions all the right times. You, you never mess up. You never fail. You, uh, you're never in despair. You're always joyful at the top of the mountain peak, never having to worry about hindsight being 2020 because you saw it long before you even came to that decision. No past regrets. No groans. No. Anybody? No. At least we're all together. This is what August, Augustine said. He said that the beginning of knowledge is to know oneself to be a sinner. The beginning of knowledge is to know oneself to be a sinner. And in order to be reminded of how sinful we can be and God's gracious forgiveness we have a psalm here that God engraved, that Augustine engraved on his wall of his bedroom, so, so stories say, so that he could see it every day. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Psalms 32 and just hold it there for a little bit. I came across a, um, a movie, and I'll be honest with you, I haven't seen this movie. I'm going to play a clip from this movie. Uh, but it's going to be a silent, so just if you've never seen a silent movie, it wasn't silent, but tonight it's going to be a silent movie because I haven't seen it and I'm not recommending it to anybody. But there's a part in there that, that I think perfectly illustrates um, what God, I think, wants to speak to us tonight. And this movie is called The Mission. And it stars Robert De Niro, and he plays, De Niro, excuse me, and he plays a mercenary who is 
taken asylum up in this church, in the local church, after having killed his brother. And, and after he, he eventually leaves the church and he heads to the South American jungle uh, and he takes asylum because he feels so bad about what he's done and he is so grief-stricken uh, about taking the life of his brother, he takes asylum in this, this mission, if you will, that is located, this mission post is located in the South American jungle. And what you're gonna see is that because of what he's done and because of how bad he feels about what he's done, the guilt and the shame and the regret that he carries with him every single day, because of that, he ties himself to a net that's carrying several hundred pounds of items and these items represent his, the sin, the, the sinfulness, his life. He feels compelled everywhere he goes to drag this sack of sin around as a, as, as a way of penance. Like in order for him to be absolved, the only way that he feels like he'll ever feel better is to carry this around and to go through life with this reminder and struggle every day with this reminder. So as you watch this clip, you'll see him slip under the burden of his past and you'll have this rope that is literally trying to choke the, li the very life out of him and he feels terrible about what he's done but he doesn't know what to do to rid himself of the shame. So just in this very short clip, I wanna show you this movie, uh, this, this clip from this movie. And if you'll just kind of be ready to hit pause, um, would you go ahead and show that, please? You maybe, can y'all see it okay? Can we bring the lights down a little bit? Possible. Stop it if you don't mind. Stop it right there if you don't mind. You see him, and we're gonna play the rest of that clip here in a minute, but you see him struggling to get this thing uphill, and it is a burden, and he's carrying it, and he feels compelled to carry it because of the guilt and the shame of what he's done. And the question is, as we dig into this tonight, is have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt that the decisions you made were so regrettable, so shameful, that you were guilt-ridden daily by that decision? What do you do when you realize that you've messed up? How do you stabilize your life when you experience more ups and downs than the current stock market? Where do you go when you have failed? And where do you turn when you've hurt those that are closest to you? You have your Bibles. Psalms chapter 32. You there? Say amen. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It'll be up on your screen. It says, oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven. Say the word forgiven. Whose sin is put out, put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Verse four, day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, he says in verse five, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt was gone. Therefore, let all of the, God, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time. 
that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you, long, uh, guide you along the best path for your life. I will advise you and I will watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Verse 10, many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surround those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad. All you who obey him, shout for joy. All whose hearts are pure. Have you ever felt like the man in the video felt where you were just carrying around this guilt, carrying around this shame needlessly? But at the time, you didn't know it was needlessly because all you could think about was that decision. I love what David is saying here. And listen, a little background before we really kind of jump into those verses. David here is the author. And we know from history and from God's word, that history from his word, we know that, that he was a great king and that God walked with David for much of his life. But we also know the sins that David committed. We know the sins of, the, of, of adultery and we know the sins of murder that, that he made the decision to do. Sins that, that not only affected him, but it affected his relationship with other people. It affected his relationship with God. And David carried that guilt. He carried that shame. He carried it deep in his heart. When David speaks, he does so as a sinner who has been forgiven here. He understands what forgiveness means to the believer, to the disciple. And the particular sin that David refers to is not important because there were plenty to choose from. But he wrote this psalm to help us to know that we can be fully restored and completely forgiven no matter what we've done. And that when we walk the path of forgiveness, joy comes to the heart and the life of a believer. That's what I want to talk to you about tonight. And that's what I gather from this psalm, and I've said this, uh, this comment a couple of times in the last few weeks, and I'm gonna make it again, and that is this. When God makes the effort of repeating himself, either in words or, or, or subject matter, it would behoove his, the, his followers to pay close attention to that repetition, rep, repetition and take notes. He's saying it for a very important reason. This psalm is one of seven psalms of forgiveness. Psalm 6, 32, 38, 51, 102, 130, and, and, and 143 are all psalms of forgiveness. You have this record, if you will, of, of the daily life of somebody's walk with God from, from, uh, for the book of Psalms. And yet seven times God, God set aside an entire psalm just to remind us of the importance of forgiveness. In other words, God wants us to understand the importance of forgiveness and, to, and the need to make it a part of our spiritual disciplines, daily making sure that our hearts are right with God. Psalms 32, in fact, Paul in Romans 4, 6, uh, ex extensively quoted Psalms 32 to help establish that we are declared righteous not by what we have done, but because of what Christ has done for us. So with that in mind, there's a couple of things that I draw from these verses that I want to share with you tonight and, I, and, um, and that I hope speaks to your heart. One of the things we've been already talking about is forgiveness. Turn to your neighbor again and say forgiveness. The joy that comes with forgiveness. Verses one and two says, oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is what? forgiven and whose sin has been put out of sight. This, the very first verse sets the tone for the entire psalm, for the entire psalm. I've never felt like, I've, I'm, excuse me, I've always felt like, and, and this is just me, but I've always felt like heaven rejoices a little bit when the Holy Spirit throws up a red flag to us and we acknowledge the red flag and we make the right decision. I've always felt like there is just like a little applause from heaven when the disciple is faced with, with, as in us, when we are faced with a right and a wrong decision. 
when we have a spiritual battle going on in our life between what our spirit man is telling us to do and what our flesh is telling us to do. And that a little celebration from heaven takes place when we heed the warning of the Holy Spirit to do what the spirit man, what the word, what God's presence is telling us to do. We are blessed when we do what is right, and yet when we do sin, and when we do mess up, and we have our sins forgiven, when we do make the wrong choice, the the regrettable choice, the the choice that we understand that God didn't want us to make, there is also, uh, Psalms 32 says that we we still can be blessed and, and, and filled with joy when we make our hearts right with God. And David expresses that. That word forgiven means to to lift a heavy burden and to carry it away. And that's what God does when we find an altar or we're sitting in our car on the way to work or we're kneeling beside our bed at night. Uh, when we've just finished a, a conversation with somebody that was that was that should have never happened and we walk away and we're feeling a little sh- sh- shame and, and guilt that when we find that, take that opportunity to ask God to make our hearts right. We didn't want it. We didn't want to do that. We don't want to do that. God, make it right that the Holy Spirit just lifts that burden, carries it away as God cleanses us. The sins are, are washed away. And instead of trying to tug them along like you saw him do in the clip, we allow the Lord to lift them from us. The problem is so many times we ask God to relieve us of a burden We ask God to forgive us. We ask God to to break a chain of sin that has kept us bound over and over and over again, maybe for years. And so we'll come to an altar under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and we'll confess and we will do all of those things and we will yield to the Lord. But what happens? We get back up from the altar and we put that backpack back on because we don't want to leave it for somebody else to pick up maybe or whatever. And we, we walk home with the same thing God just relieved us from. It means to carry it away, that it goes away. David here refers to the joy of forgiveness, the erasing of sin. Sometimes we want to pick that sin back up because it feels good or feels right or it's just what we're we're listening to the flesh, but God desires to erase that sin. I love what Isaiah 118 says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They, though they are as red as crimson, they shall be made like wool. God forgives when we ask for forgiveness because of something that we feel shame about. And we, we make the effort and we sit down at an altar or in our car or wherever we are and we have that conversation with God. He washes us. I was reminded of a man that who was telling his friend about an argument that he had had with his wife. And he says, every time we have an argument, she gets historical. And his friend corrected him and said, you mean hysterical, don't you? He said, no, I mean historical, because every time we fight, she drags stuff up from the past and she holds on to it. And she just hits me with it again and again and again. They, have, they can get historical. But aren't you glad God doesn't get historical with our sins? Right? When he forgives, he forgives. When he washes clean, he washes clean. We don't have to carry that guilt and shame. We don't have to lug that up a mountain and, 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 and be burdened by the work of, of holding on to it. Psalms 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us? He said there in verse two of 32, we read it. He says, God's, God's, it says that God does this for, for the one whose lives, is it, who lives, excuse me, in complete honesty. You know what so many people love about Halloween? They can wear a mask. They can hide behind a mask for just a little bit of time. I wonder how often we as believers do the same thing. It may not be a physical mask that changes our appearance, but 
It's a mask that hides maybe who we really are when nobody else is around. It's a mask that maybe hides our conversations. It's a mask that maybe hides things that we've done in secret. It's a mask that maybe hides things from those that we're closest to. But he says, those who live in complete honesty. That means, that, that, that doesn't mean someone who has no faults. It doesn't refer to people who, who think that they um, uh, are perfect because nobody raises their hand when I ask that question. It refers to those who readily admit their sin to the Lord. It's, an, it's, it's, it's the idea of authenticity, that God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I don't have life figured out. I know that I'm not gonna make all the right decisions all the right times. I understand that I'm gonna fail, that I'm gonna stumble, that I'm gonna fall, and that I'm gonna look back in hindsight and regret some of the decisions I made, some of them immediately. But this idea of authenticity is saying, God, I know I'm not perfect, because I know that I need you. Because I know that I need your forgiveness. And I know that I want to be right with you. You see, the key to the Christian life is not in our attempts at perfection, but it's, our, it's, it's, it's in our repentance. Because it's understanding that no matter how hard we try, we will never fully live up to perfection. We'll never fully live up to God's word, making all the right decisions all the right time. But yet, God doesn't expect that from you and me. God doesn't expect you to be perfect. He doesn't expect you to be faultless. He doesn't expect you to be without blame. And where the Christian life comes in, that God's pleased with is the one that understands that when I mess up, I go back to the source of joy. I go back to my source of forgiveness. And I do and say whatever I need to say in a moment of authenticity to say, God, I'm sorry. I think sometimes far too many of us are dishonest about our sins. There's a book that was written entitled Not the Way We're Supposed to Be by Cornelius Plantiga. And this is what he says in this passage. He says, the awareness of sin used to be our shadow. In other words, it wasn't just out there for the world to see, right? Christians hated sin. They feared it. They fled from it. They grieved over it. Some of our grandparents agonized over it. A man who lost his temper might wonder whether he could still go to Holy Communion. Where sin is concerned now, people just mumble. The question is, are we mumbling about our failures? Are we making excuses? Are we attempting to hide our disobedience? And I think what God is calling us to is understanding that there is no such moral myopia that exists where there's perfection from anybody. David describes what happens in verses three through five, and it brings us to our second point, which is sin is very heavy. Look at verse three. David writes, when I refused to confess, my body wasted away like I, and I groaned all day long. David here is reflecting on a time when he, when he chose to keep quiet about his sins. He chose to internalize it and, and, and walk through some separations between him and the Lord. And when he tried to ignore his sins, what he's saying is his bones felt like they were dying on the inside. This one says my body. Uh, the NIV version says my bones. It was like an inward dying away, an inward rotting away. And that word groaning is, is, is used uh, it, it, it kind of describes the roaring of a, uh, of a wounded animal. In fact, Job uses that same word in Job 3.24 to describe his agony. He said, for sighing comes to me instead of food, my groans pour out like water. Job had experienced great loss in his life. And he was groaning at that loss. And David here is groaning at what unconfessed sin is doing to the, on, the, on the inside of him that it went on all day long, continuously, without intermission. And here's the point. When we don't own our sins, our bodies revolt because our bodies are not prepared to carry guilt 
our hearts are not, are, not, are not conditioned in the long term to carry shame. They're not conditioned to do it. That instead of happiness, we experience heartache. When we, when, when we keep our mouth shut from, from sin and we hide sin, our conscience screams at us. Why? Because we're not built to carry it. When we bottle up evil, our bones waste away. Proverbs 28, 13 says, he who conceals his sins does not prosper. We could put it this way. We are only as healthy as our hidden sins. I've had so many conversations with people through the years that they said, you know, Gary, when I gave my heart to the Lord, there were some things that I just wanted to hold on to because I just needed them. It's like, so I buried them I buried him into the darkest part of my heart, the deepest part of my heart, and I would let God's light shine everywhere but there. We are only as healthy, spiritually speaking and physically speaking, as, as our hidden sins. What have you been concealing? That's what the Holy Spirit's asking us tonight. What is it that you've been hiding? Verse four says this, for day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. Have you ever tried, don't answer this, but have you ever tried running away from the Lord? I am convinced that the most miserable person on earth is the person that once walked with God and then isn't anymore. It's because they have found truth, they have found unconditional love, they have found joy and peace, and they walked away from it to nothingness. And I am convinced with every fiber of my body that the most miserable person on the planet is the person that walked with God and then walked without him. Even at night, David could not rest from the cries of his conscience and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That word heavy means to grievously afflict. God's hand can bring joy, but it can also bear down on us when things need to be made right. And I'm thankful for that. Not in the moment, right? Have you ever just laid in bed at night, unable to sleep, your heart aching, your mind turning, full of regret, full of shame, full of despair, wishing with everything in you that you could have done things differently? Just a heaviness that was resting on. You know what that heaviness was? It was the hand of God trying to bring discipline. It was just a heaviness, your heavy hand upon me. Listen, it's all because God cares and love, loves us so much. You realize if I didn't love my kids, I would never correct or discipline my kids. If I didn't have any desire to see them become everything God destines them to be, I would not care and I would just let them do whatever they wanted to do. Right? It's the same way with the Lord and us. When God's heavy hand of discipline is on us, it is God trying to speak to us and to draw us back in. He loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to keep us living that way. Hebrews 12.10 says, God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. David recalls feeling like his strength was zapped in, in verses two through eight. And he describes that. He says, for, in, in another translation, he put it this way. For your arrows have pierced me and your hand has come down upon me. My bones have no soundness because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are lonesome because of my sin. I am feeble and utterly crushed. He is feeling it. I groan in, ang in anguish of heart. See, guilt is really a divine purpose because it's graciously designed to bring the sinner back to God again. That's what guilt does. It's, it's meant to draw us back to the Lord. And, and these verses remind us that when we don't fully confess, we're gonna experience that kind of distress. Anger and bitterness can, can come as a result of unconfessed sin. I love what, there's a story about a famed psychiatrist called Carl Menninger. And he once wrote this. He said that if he could convince his patients in the psychiatric hospitals that their sins were forgiven, this famed psychiatrist said 
75% of them would get up and walk out healthy the next day. Our confession of sin is restoration. That's why he wrote Selah there. It means to pause. It means to think about it. Our confession will bring restoration. There were two elderly southern women sitting together in a, in a front pew of the church one Sunday. And they were listening to their fiery preacher preach, right? And he was banging on the pulpit and the ladies there on the front row were just cheering him on. And when he condemned the sin of stealing, the two church ladies stood up and they yelled, yes, brother, preach it. And when he, and when he condemned the sin of lust, they yelled again, preach it, pastor, preach it. And when he spoke against lying, they jumped to their feet and they screamed, right on, brother, right on, tell it like it is, amen. But when the preacher man condemned the sin of gossip, They got very quiet. One lady turned to the other and said, well, I guess he quit preaching. Now he's just meddling. Now he's just meddling. Sin has a way of shutting us up, doesn't it? Just getting us on the inside. I got to hurry. Verse 5 gives us the right approach. When David could find relief no other way, it says, then, he wrote, then I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover up my iniquity. This is from the NIV version. I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. When we take a moment and we just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna carry this anymore. I don't wanna feel shame and regret and guilt anymore. Right then and there, God forgave David. David confessed, David found forgiveness. We can't expect God to cover what we're unwilling to co uncover. We can't expect God to cover talking about our sins, what we're unwilling, what we're not willing to uncover before him. We're gonna keep hidden sins. God can't cover something that we won't confess. There is no forgiveness. I think David might have been feeling, feeling like the prodigal son who just kind of grown tired of living with pigs. He just kind of grew tired of living the life that he was never destined to live. He knew what it was like to be in the father's house. David knew what it was like to be surrounded in God's presence and to, and to know the favor and the joy and the blessings and the hand of the Lord. David knew all of that. So when it was gone, have you ever just felt so surrounded by God's presence that you felt comforted, that you felt trust, trust you felt, you felt, you felt all of those things that God's presence brings. And then have you ever had a season in your life when you didn't feel that anymore? And what that feeling was like, I think that's what David was describing here, is that he knew God's blessings, he knew God's presence, he knew God's forgiveness, he knew everything that there was, to, he, he, everything that he had experienced with the Lord, that he held dear, that he, had, that he held as valuable, all of a sudden, it was gone. And he so missed it that he laid groaning to get it back again. I know, we all know what that feeling is like when we have the presence of the Lord in our life and then we don't. And that's what David felt here. He owns his wrong and he doesn't make any excuses. Confess literally means to say the same thing that God says about your sin. And until we can, God, until we can say, God, you're right, it's wrong what I did, then we haven't confessed. You were right, I was wrong. Folks, that's confession. But it's not just saying it. It's being willing to not pick that backpack up again and to turn away and to walk away from it. You gotta own it. Stand to your feet with me because I gotta close. You gotta own it.
from a very young age, we, um, we have taught our kids how to own their mistakes. Don't, don't push it off on anybody else. Nope, we don't do that. It's nobody else's fault you said what you said. It's nobody else's fault you did what you did. You did it. And so one day they're down at the neighbor's house. Bria is, and she was really young. We were in Dallas at the time. And she was playing a couple houses down with her friend in the house. And, and she came home, and the mother of her friend came a couple of hours later and just says, I got to tell you what your daughter said. I can tell that you, you guys must have a lot of teaching in your home. There might be some psychology teaching in your home or something. I said, well, what are you talking about? She said, well, Bria and my daughter did something wrong. It was no big deal. But when I confronted them about it, Bria looked at me and said, I own it. I did wrong. I own it. It was my, it was me. I, I own it. She goes, she's four. I said, we do. We teach our kids not to pass off what they've done wrong to somebody else. To own it. I want my kids to know that to walk with the Lord, to experience God's presence, to experience his hand of blessing, you got to own it. I'm not going to show the rest of that clip. Thank you. Just because of time, our kids' workers are about to go hysterical, not historical. But the rest of that clip shows one of those guys that were standing around. You might have saw the beginning of it before I had it cut. Takes out his sword and he just begins to cut that weight. And he cuts the rope and the weight falls down the, 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 the hill that he's trying to work his way up. He's free. And in a moment when he should have been joyous because the weight was gone, the weight that represented his sin and his guilt was gone and it rolled down the mountain. You know what he did? He didn't celebrate. He turns around, walks down the mountain and he picks it up again. We do it. How many times do we ask God to forgive us for the very same sin over and over and over and over and over and over again? Because he forgives us and we pick it right back up again. And we have the guilt and shame. Here's the thing about it though, is there comes a point when you begin to nominalize it where the first time that you sinned and, and you, you were shameful of it, it bothered you. But the 50th time you've done it and asked for forgiveness, I think at some point human nature says, eh. Because we're used to going back down the mountain and picking it up again. God wants you to be free. God wants you to have freedom. God wants you to experience joy. If there's no joy in your life, you have to ask yourself why. Why is there no joy in my life? If there's no joy in my life, is it because, and only you and the Holy Spirit know it, but is it because of unconfessed sin? If it is, fix it. Be free. Be free. Turn to your neighbor and say, be free be free. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your word, Lord. Psalms 32. I didn't get through all of it tonight, but God, I'm thankful that you are able to speak to our hearts. And I pray that, Lord, that we would go home tonight and, and this week and we would study the rest of that passage because it speaks so clearly to needing forgiveness every day. And what comes into our life, what you deposit, the benefits of forgiveness that you deposit into our hearts when we stay right with you. Joy and protection and advice. Speak to us tonight. Draw us to your word. Let us not leave here with the same chains we walked in with. 
But God, let us experience true freedom tonight for once and for all. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we just spend some time in prayer? If the Holy Spirit's spoken to your heart in any way, let him do his work in you. God bless you. I'm here if you need any prayer for anything. you